Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are doing a Q&A session. So I've got an ask at ancestry.com email box and I get questions there constantly. So I've just gone through and pulled a few that I think would be of interest to a large number of you and we're just gonna run through those questions and some of those answers. Now, if you are just interested in a specific question, if you check the description here on the YouTube video, there will be uh, the questions with the timestamps so you can jump ahead in the video to where those questions are asked and answered. With that introduction, let's go ahead and dive in. Our first question today is from Stephanie. Stephanie asks how she records people with multiple names in her family tree. Now there are a lot of reasons why people might have multiple names. Sometimes it's because they immigrated from a different country and when they got to the United States or to England or to Canada, uh, that they actually used an anglicized version of a name that they had used in a different language. And so while the two names might be similar, they're different enough that you're gonna wanna record both so that you can find them in records. Sometimes somebody might change their name entirely. Uh, there are certainly cases, I think, Stephanie's query was about a family member who was running from the law and so moved their family down to Texas entirely, started going by a different name. Um, there are also now uh, cases of people who are going through uh, gender reassignment or who are transgender and identify with an entirely different name. So lots of different reasons why somebody might have a name change and there are ways to record that in your Ancestry online tree. You get to choose how you want to record it, but I will just share with you a couple of the ways that I do it in my own tree. So first of all, when you're on the profile page of somebody in your tree, right over here under the facts tab, you have this little name and gender toggle that allows you to see uh, other names or genders that they may have identified with and you can expand or contract that. Here in that same facts column under add, you have, like I said, a couple of options. Here is what I do. I add a fact event and the fact event that I add is name. And what that does is it allows me to get to put in an alternate name or another name for this person. Now this is used when you have a name change. When there's just variant spellings of the name, like her name, in some records she's C-A-R-R-A, in some records she's listed as Caroline. She was named for her grandmother, um, Charlotta. There's, I mean, there's lots of different ways that that comes out. Sometimes Inman is spelled with two N's, sometimes with one. Her married name was Cowan. So lots of different ways that people's names are recorded in records. If you wanna keep track of all those, that's fine. I choose not to. I pick a name and then just include all the spelling variants in my notes. But uh, when we're talking about a total name change, this is where you're gonna enter that. This is one of the places you can enter that. The key here though is you have to then determine which one of those names you want to select as the preferred name. And that's the name that's gonna show up in the header. So all the names will show up over here under this name toggle drop down here, but the preferred name is going to show up in the header. So that's how you make that decision. Now, there are a couple of other ways you can do this if you so choose. One is there is an also known as fact. So you can choose to use that instead of adding an alternate name. Um, that might be particular if you're using nicknames or you wanna keep track of um, other types of uh, name changes or, or name differences. The other option, again, here you have is custom event. Now, the way that I would probably use custom event is if there was an actual date attached to the name change. So I would add a custom event, call it a name change, because then, then that allows me to enter a date associated with that name change so that I can then say, you know what, from this point to this point in his life, he went by this name, and then from this date on, he went by this name. And that way when I'm looking for records, I know what name I should be looking for those records under. Uh, so that gives you three options. You can use any one of them or any combination of the three to record that information in your family tree. So hopefully, Stephanie, that was um, useful and answered the heart of your question. 
Our next question is uh, from Jules. Jules asks how to add multiple parents for a person in her family tree. Now again, lots of different scenarios where this might come into play. Uh, in some cases, it might be because a person is adopted and they want to record both their adopted family and their biological family. In some cases, it's because you have step parents or foster parents. Maybe it's because the person that raised you your whole life that you thought was your father, you took a DNA test and found out he's not biologically your father and so you wanna be able to trace both the family tree of the man you knew and loved who raised you as your father and the new father that you're discovering biologically through your DNA matches. So again, lots of different reasons, that's just some of them, why people might want to add multiple parents in their family tree, and it is totally possible. So again, back here on the person profile page, we're gonna come up here and click on edit, and then we are going to edit relationships. And that's going to give you the option to add an alternate father and or an alternate mother. So we're gonna click on add alternate father, now, if the person is already in your tree, you can just start, start typing their name. If they're not already in your tree, you just click this Add a New Person button, and then you go ahead and you add the new parent. And what will happen then is both fathers or both mothers will show up there on uh, the relationship screen. Now, here's the thing that you need to know about this. Because of the way that family trees are constructed, Currently, you can only view one set of parents at a time. So you'll be able to see if there are multiple parents in the tree by just clicking on Edit Relationships, and you'll have both parents. One will be set as the preferred set of parents, and then the other one will say Make Preferred, meaning they're the alternate. The preferred parents are who you want, um, are biological, in the case where you have taken a DNA test. So if you've taken a DNA test, and your tree is attached to your DNA, which it should be, then you wanna make the biological parents the preferred parents because that's gonna help you and your matches make sense of all of your DNA matches. If you have the non-biological parents set as preferred, it's gonna be super confusing to you and your matches when you're trying to figure out your DNA. Now, if you haven't taken a DNA test or if you uh, don't have your DNA test attached to your tree, then you can toggle back and forth at will between either sets of parents, okay? But again, you add them under edit and edit relationships and you can add as many sets of parents as you want. I will just point out, we do give you some options for how to label those relationships. So you can add parents that are biological or adopted, step, foster, um, guardians, you can add unknown parental relationships, uh, however you choose to connect people. But again, if you've taken a DNA test, the biological parents need to be set as the preferred parents for you in order to work with your DNA matches. Okay. Next up is a question from Kay. So Kay is asking about record hints. So she got a record hint uh, to someone in her tree, but when she viewed the record hint, it was for someone else in her tree. The problem is when you're viewing a record through hints, the only options to save that record are yes, no, or maybe. But she wants to be able to take that record and save it to someone else in her tree. So let me show you how you can do that. We're gonna look at two different kinds of hints here. So the first kind of hint we're gonna look at is this top one here. And what happens here is this hint is actually, it's, it's showing up on Carrie because Carrie is mentioned in the record. But if you look at this, it's listed as an Ohio birth record, and there's no birth date or place. What that tells me is that this record isn't actually for Carrie. This record is for her son, Robert. And the way to double check that is I can just click on Robert, and now there's a birth date and place listed. Okay? So that's really important, uh, because when you're viewing the hint from this perspective, um, there's not going to be date information. Now, it's important that we've indexed Carrie and Park on this record because they are the parents of Robert. This particular record is proof of parentage. It is evidence that they are his parents. Um, and so we want to make sure that they're accounted for. But if it was me, I would not save this record to Carrie because that, if I click yes, it's going to save it kind of odd. 
I always try to click on these links in the record to figure out who the primary person is on the record. In this case, it's the child. And now I have a save button. So now I can actually save the record. And in the process of saving the record, it will ask me if I also want to attach it to the parents. Okay. And so now I'm creating um, the record that is a birth record for Robert. I'm saving it to him with the birth date in place. And then I can choose to link it to the parents as well if I want. Saving it from this perspective is going to make everything work a little more smoothly than if you were trying to save it from Carrie's perspective or from Park's perspective. Hopefully that made sense. Okay. So that is one instance where uh, when, you have, when you have a record, if you just click through to view the other people on the record, that save button will show up and you won't have to worry about the yes, no, and maybe. Now, there is another instance that, um, that was brought up in the question, and that is, if I have this record and I decide this isn't for this person in my tree, but my only options are yes, no, and maybe, how do I save this record to the correct person in my tree? Now again, there are several ways to do this. I'm going to show you how I do it. I happen to think it's fairly simple. Come up here and take a look at the URL. So on this URL up here, if I come up here, um, I have some pieces of information. Uh, the first thing in this URL here is a DBID or a database ID. And that references this Ohio County Marriage Records Index. Then I have a tree ID, that's the ID for my tree, and then I have a person ID, and that's the ID for this person in my tree, and then following that in the URL, I have a hint ID, which is the uh, URL for this specific hint, which is why, and that piece right there is what generates this yes, no, maybe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everything from the hint ID to the end of the URL, and I'm just going to delete it and hit enter. And what you're going to see now is it's going to show me that exact same record, but now I have a save button instead of the yes, no, and maybe. And I have the option here to save it to someone else in my tree. So what you're looking for in the URL is the and H ID or and hint ID. Just delete that and everything after it and hit enter. And now you can save this record to anybody else in your tree. Of course, the other way you can do this is to actually go out and do a search in the Ohio County Marriage Records database. So you just click the Learn More link here at the bottom, go find that record, and then save it to somebody in your tree. But I find that URL manipulation technique a little bit easier. Okay, next question. Jane asks, what information do I need to give people so they can find my online family tree? So Jane has a public family tree which means anybody who has an Ancestry subscription can view her tree, and she wants to be able to share with people how to access that tree. Now, she could invite them to be guests on her tree, and that way they'll get an email with a link directly to the tree. But if her tree is already public, um, there's no need for her to manage those invitations and those permissions if she can just give them information about her online tree. This is another situation where the URL is going to come in handy. Uh, so, if I come here, this is my tree, and we happen to be viewing the tree from the perspective of my grandfather, okay, and if I want to share my public tree with somebody or invite somebody to come view my family tree who has an Ancestry subscription, all I have to do is just copy this URL and send that to them. The other thing I could do is just share this number in the URL with them. That is a tree ID number, and that is the ID number for my tree. Nobody else in Ancestry has that tree number. So anybody could go view a tree and then just replace the tree ID with my tree ID number and they would find my tree. So tree ID or URL of your tree is the fastest and easiest way to share your tree with other people. Now, this also works from the reverse. So another one of the questions that I got asked this month was, if I found a family tree, and I want to go back and look at it, how do I do that? How do I find it without having to search for someone in the tree? A lot of people just look at the tree name and think, oh, I'll just use the tree name. Well, there's two problems with that. The first problem is, is that people can and do change their tree name at any time. So what was their tree name yesterday might not be their tree name today. 
The second reason that that's not the best way to do this is because um, there are uh, lots of trees that might have the exact same name. And so if you have the Jones family tree, well, anybody could have a Jones family tree. There could be 300 of them on Ancestry. And so doing a search that way is no easier or better than doing a search for someone in the tree. So again, when you see a tree that you're interested in, the easiest thing to do is just to copy the URL and either bookmark it. Some people keep a folder, um, a bookmark folder in their web browser that is the family trees that they're interested in. Some people like myself, I keep stuff like that in um, a program called OneNote, where I just keep a list of trees that I want to refer to for other people who are researching the same families. Another thing you can do is uh, you can actually just put a note on a person in your tree. So for example, I've got Wilhelmina Reisler here. And there are a couple people out there who have her in a tree and who have parents for her. So I might copy the URL of those trees and just put those uh, on Wilhelmina in a note so that when I come back to research her and I'm reviewing my research notes, I then know exactly what other people out there are researching that tree. So again, easiest way to find another tree or to share the information about your public tree with others is just to copy this URL or to copy this tree ID number and then plug it into a URL. Hope that made sense. Okay, uh, next question is from Gail. Gail asks, where can I find a birth record in Colonial Virginia? So, um, I have a quick and easy answer for you, Gail, <laughs> but I also think I'm going to do a much longer video about direct versus indirect evidence, and here's why. For me, when I want to know where to find a particular record or if records even exist, um, what I will usually do is just do a quick Google search. So, Colonial Virginia birth records, right? I'll type in something like that. And Family Search has a wiki, and that wiki will tell you exactly when different states in the U.S. or different countries in the world started keeping birth records. So in the case of Virginia specifically, what we discover is, is that statewide registration of births did not uh, start until June of 1912. Okay? From 1853 to 1913, births were recorded at a county level. And before 1853, no births were recorded by either the county or the state. So if we're talking about colonial Virginia before 1776, well, there are no births that were recorded um, as a birth record in an official capacity. So you have to use alternate records. And what that sometimes means is we have to use indirect evidence. Now, like I said, I'm going to do a whole video on indirect evidence probably in October or November, so watch for that. But essentially what it means is there are times where there is never a record that gives you the explicit answer that you're looking for. So you will never find a record that says, my John Smith, born in Virginia in about 1760, there's no record that's going to give you his exact birth date. Now, there are other records that will tell you his age, that will give you clues to help narrow it down, evidence that says, yes, it really wasn't 1860, it was probably more like 1862, okay? But you're not going to say the 21st of November, you know, 1762. That's not going to be on a record anywhere. And sometimes we have to be okay with that <laughs> um, because, like in this case, colonial Virginia birth records uh, were not a thing. Okay. And that is far more common than uncommon, especially the further back in history you go. Indirect evidence has to be used to answer some of those very specific genealogical questions. Okay, well, that is all I have for you today. Um, hopefully that was useful information. If you have other questions that you would like to see included on a Q&A video, or if you have suggestions for topics for future videos, you can email me at ask at ancestry.com. Also, be sure to subscribe here to the Ancestry YouTube channel so that you get notified whenever a new episode of The Barefoot Genealogist is uploaded. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.